renovated retirement with charlie jewett oh no i think i'm about to have another episode hey everybody charlie jewett here with the renovating retirement podcast have a really really neat and unique guest uh this will be unlike any other show we've ever done um, I have Brian Spiridonov from Cal Choice Investments, which I didn't know anything about until probably three, four months ago. Um, as you know, I always keep my ear to the ground and uh, kind of keep my eyes open for anything that would be good for you to grow your assets and get you to and through retirement. And I don't think that stocks, bonds, and mutual funds are the holy grail and the answer to everything like the Joker brokers do. So Brian, you work in an area and a type of investment that's quite unique because people love real estate, but it's not the traditional you know, flip a house or buy and hold or, or, you know, live in it and hope for the appreciation. You actually work in land banking, which I didn't even know what that meant. So let's start here. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, doing Thank you for having me. You know, you're doing something right now. Thank you for carving out the time. You actually had some sort of a baseball tournament or something like that? Oh, yeah. It's a, a Junior Olympic USA Baseball uh, showcase event in, in Arizona, 93 teams. Um, just phenomenal. Great, great baseball and- do you have children in it, or why are you there? I do, yeah. My my fifteen year old son is uh, is playing. So nice, nice. Did you play ball too, or any other sports? I did. Yeah, I played football and baseball in high school, and then I played baseball afterwards. Uh, scouting league for a little little while. Um, nothing big, nothing major. But I played football. It was like the worst tailback ever. I was like, I wasn't big or fast. I'm just this tiny little slow person, which is not what you want for tailback. Oh, that's, so, that's yeah. So I I heard about this a while back, saw a couple of videos, and just I'm like, I don't know what the term means, right? And by the way, the title of this show came from something you said on a webinar. I don't know if you created it, but I just thought it was genius. Uh, the title of this episode is "The Best Investment on Earth Is Earth." Did you write that? No, I did not. I, I did not. I and, love that. Where did that come from? No, I'm thinking. Um, it may have been Mark Twain. Nice. He also no. said, buy land, they're not making it anymore. Yeah, we've got, buy land, they're not making it anymore. The best investment on earth is earth. And is it Will, Will Rogers that said, don't wait to buy land, buy land and wait? Buy land and wait. That's exactly. Buy land and wait, baby. So yeah. I, I love this, and I want to talk about this term. I've actually gone out and seen these properties now before even bringing it up to my audience. Um, what does the term land banking mean? Who, are we banking by lending money to someone? Or what does the term actually mean? Or is it one of those terms like, like tax torpedo that's just sort of an unfortunate term because it doesn't explain the situation very well? Well, land banking, one, first and foremost, it's been around forever. Real estate has been the oldest, safest, and most secure form of wealth creation. But many of us see real estate as a house. We think we've got equity you know, well, hopefully we do have equity in our house and it's growing, but many people think that the equity is coming from the home appreciating, but the home's a depreciating asset. So oftentimes I'll be sitting down with a client or over the phone and I'll ask them to pull out their insurance declaration page and read off the estimated cost to rebuild the house. And the cost to rebuild the house might be 200 grand or, you know, 250, but they're paying taxes on Mm $800,000. That's when it really becomes present to them. And they realize that the value is in the land. It's not the dwelling that's depreciating every single day. So we've been land banking one way or another. Um, Oftentimes I'll ask, I'll start a call off and say, have you ever heard of land banking? Or did you know what land banking is before it was introduced to you? No, I've never heard of it. 99% of the time, that's what people say, but we've been doing it in the sense that We own a home, we're waiting for the value to mature, but of course the land's maturing, or we're a part of somebody else's land banking plan if we lease a home. It's been around a long time. Land banking is simply buying land before it's needed for development, waiting for its value to mature, and then selling it for a significant profit in the future. That's a really neat point because we, I was in real estate, right? Um, We are somewhat connected to uh, a real estate company in a sense that we have similar models. And so we're we're around real estate that way. The type of financial services that I do often are related to real estate. And there really is a belief that real estate appreciates. You know, somebody buys a house 30 years ago for $50,000 and they're selling it for a million in the Bay Area or whatever. But the, the home that they put on 30 years ago for 50 grand 
would not be worth now. It'd be decrepit. The thing would probably be have rebuilt two or three times. What's appreciating is the earth, right? That's correct. And that's an important piece because it doesn't need to have a depreciating building on it to be a, a good investment. I have a friend that works with you guys um, that did one of your land banking deals and, you know, it seemed like it, had, it was in a growing area. It was all very, uh, it all looked very good, had great potential. Let's say that heading in the right direction. As it turns out, as the area developed, uh, it turns out that the piece he bought is going to be right across the street from the new airport. And that changes things dramatically for the value of his land, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So I guess it's not, everything's not a home run, but can land banking be kind of singles and doubles, singles and doubles every now and then a strikeout and then every now and then a home run? Well, you know, we've never had a strikeout. Nice. Yeah. The fact is, is, you know, look, here we anticipate when we share and we present, we make it abundantly clear that we anticipate a seven to 10 year hold time. Yep. Can it happen sooner? Of course. We have an independent study by an outside firm that showed average hold period of 3.7 years. But we anticipate that seven to 10 year hold time on purpose because one, people understand investments take time to mature, right? Mm -hmm. This is not a get rich quick, flip overnight. Has that happened? As a matter of fact, it has. However, you know, they understand that we want to set those expectations. Now, as it relates to the strikeout that you mentioned, the thing that could happen, the one thing is that we may have to hold it a little bit longer. Mm -hmm the day right because land always has value especially when it's done in the 15th largest economy in the world second in the u.s with 19.2 million people with no land left in the la basin and only one predictable place to go which is the antelope valley because that's the closest proximity to los angeles so they've done a lot of work infrastructure 380 million dollars widening the five freeway to the 14 freeway interchange the 14 freeway used to be two lanes in each direction. Now it's up to five lanes in each direction in various parts with a carpool lane that goes to and from because 75,000 plus a day it's estimated to make the commute. So it's predictable where it's going for them to spend the infrastructure, put that in place and then make it business friendly. So yeah, singles, doubles, and some home runs, you know, you can throw in a couple of triples in there as well. <laughs> That's nice. And I didn't realize, um, I just got on a bus with the, I, I didn't get to meet you because you were away this weekend, but I got on a bus with the owner and we're driving to this thing and I'm just talking to other people and then all of a sudden look up and there's Magic Mountain. I'm like, what? I've got season passes to Magic Mountain. I mean, I come to Magic Mountain all the time with my kids. We've got six kids between my girlfriend and I, but I never go past Magic Mountain. <laughs> right? Um, unless, right unless i'm going i mean i don't enjoy driving from san diego to walnut creek where my mom lives so i usually fly so i don't go past magic mountain but this area um let me say, let me draw an analogy and then get back to this area of the antelope valley when you say the strikeout could be we have to wait longer than we want so so far the strikeout hasn't been that people lost money or didn't make a fair rate of return it could be that they had to leave it in there longer than they had planned which is why it's so genius like so stinking genius and exciting that, that you can take 401k and IRA money because by definition, if you're not in your late 50s or 60s, that's, that's money you're going to leave alone anyway, right? Absolutely correct. And yeah, you bring up a really good point because we're super cautious and cognizant of everybody's individual situation, you know? So, and you can, obviously you were with our CEO and uh, Andre Vicario, and when you speak to him again, I mean, there's days that I turn down business because it's not suitable. You know, we can't put, if somebody is 68 years old and they have $100,000 to their name in a retirement account and put that $100,000 into land, they've got required minimum distributions in two and a half years. If anything comes up as far as a hiccup or an emergency, they need cash liquidity. So those we just refuse to do business with because we've got a brand to protect and most importantly, the consumer. Right. That's a big part of our lives, turning people down if it's not suitable. Like, yeah, do we want to make money? Of course. And are there agents out there that'll just take everything or rely on the applications? Of course there are. But that's, you know, from day one, 14 years ago, we've never done that. And I believe, you know, karmically, it sort of comes back to us. So what this reminds me of, um, you and I are new to each other. Um, I've been teaching for a long time, something I learned from Len Rainier at the Wealth and Wisdom Institute, which is buying insurance on your parents. Like, why are you putting money slowly into a 401k saving taxes today when they're low and then you're going to pay them when they're, when you think they're going to be higher later on or when lots of the pundits say they're going to be higher later on. So what is a 401k or an IRA? It's 
a mystery account balance. You have no idea what it's going to be worth when you retire at a mystery tax rate. Well, that's pretty hard to plan on. Like, how do you build a retirement plan out of mystery balance, mystery taxes, right? right. And Len Renier comes along at one point and teaches me this legacy planning strategy. And I'm like, dude, you're a genius. He's like, just buy insurance on your parents and leave yourself an inheritance. Well, what, what have we done if we do that? You know your payment, you know the investment amount, just like whatever you used to put in a 401k, so that can stay static. You know exactly what you're gonna get, you know, so you know the account balance, you know it won't be income taxed. What do you not know when your parents are gonna pass away, right? right? So a lot of what I've taught people is, if you're gonna have some mystery in your life, in your retirement plan, don't make it how much money you have, don't make it how much you get to keep and how much the IRS takes from you, why don't you make the mystery when you get it? So in the legacy planning world, it's like unless your parents had you when you were 13, when they get around uh, life expectancy of you know 86 to 92 or whatever, you're probably 66 to 72, right? So if you know you have this giant inheritance coming around your retirement years, that's easy to plan. We've got the same thing going on here, which is, I mean, I'm guessing if you guys say seven to 10 years, you're trying to overpromise and under deliver a little bit, right? It's not like the average case goes 10 years. Is it a little bit shorter than that? It is shorter. Yeah. We're, yeah. We're definitely under promising and, and to over deliver at the end of the day. And I heard some exciting stories like the home run kind of stories. Like you guys buy a property, people get in, all the investors get in, it's sold out. And then two or three months later, somebody comes along and they want it and you're like, and you're out and that's correct. got paid in two months, four months, six months. That's not normal, but it's pretty cool. You're watching these baseball games. Some of these kids are going to hit home runs. That's right. You're exactly right. So Antelope Valley. So let's, let's take California. California, you don't have to like California. By the way, one of the reasons I'm so excited about this, a couple things. I don't like stocks and bonds, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds right now, not because I have anything against securities. I've got a Series 65 license. I just, like 1970 to 1999, they compounded at like 13.78%. 2000 to 2018, it was more like two and a half to 4.78. And the 4.78 is if you're just buying the Vanguard index and getting all the dividends. And you and I both know, if you're with a Edward Morgan Lynch type um, brokerage firm, they're not going to charge you 1% and stick you in the S&P 500 index. They're going to spread you all over the place and make it look like they're doing something, but they're going to make less than the S&P 500, but they're going to make it look like they're doing something, right? So you're not getting all the dividends. So two and a half to 4.78 is not enough it's not more risk, more reward, right? Right. So I am limited to annuities and life insurance because the banks aren't paying, the securities aren't paying, and I can build an entire financial plan out of just annuities and life insurance, but it's an uphill battle. Like those are two things that are talked bad about in the world by financial pundits and people generally just, like if I walk into a party and goes, anybody want an annuity or life insurance? The energy goes down, right? If you walk into a party and goes, anybody want to buy some land? The energy goes up, right? Absolutely. So it's exciting to me to have another asset class to offer because yes, we do need to diversify. I mean, you're not even allowed to put, if you're worth a million bucks or you have a million dollars in the bank, let's say, and you go, I'm Charlie, I'm just like Charlie Jewett. I think annuities and life insurance are just the cat's meow. I'm going to put all my money in. The insurance companies are going to come back and go, you have to leave $250,000 out of this thing. You're not even allowed to give us all your money. Now, where do we go with that? We're actually forcing people back to the banks where they pay no interest or risk. So the insurance companies threw the baby out with the bathwater in an effort to not hurt people. They won't allow them to put all the money in, forcing them back to making no interest or gambling with their money, which is kind of silly, right? Well, it is what it is, right? But land, land, baby. I mean, I've got this new teaching. I say, like if Tiger Woods had three clubs only and I had an entire bag of clubs, he's still going to kick the crap out of me in golf, right? I'm yeah. like, give me annuities, life insurance, and land, and I will beat any financial planner in the country. Just those three tools. They can have everything. You know, Whitney Houston singing happy birthday. I'm allowed to sing Bohemian Rhapsody. Whitney Houston's going to win. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's the, the, the way you use the tools you have, not how many you have. So people don't have to like California to invest in California. Why the Antelope Valley? I mean, you know more about this area than I would guess – most people do. And don't you sit on some sort of a board or whatever? Let's just like talk about this. Well, sure. So I was asked to be a, a stakeholder for the general plan advisory committee for the city of Palmdale. So there's a lot of things that um, 
I can get my hands on things that are happening. Not everything's available to the public. So I've got to be real cautious about that, of course, um, because that uh, is a tremendous resource that has really worked out well for us and uh, definitely want to keep them in good graces. But um, so, yeah, there's, there's so many different things happening out in this area. The, again, going back to being the only predictable place to go. I mean, it's kind of interesting where we are in California. The LA Basin, if you put a dot in LA city center and you did a 360 degree radius, a 60 mile radius, a circle, there's 19.2 million people in that area, the 15th largest economy in the world, as mentioned earlier. California is fifth in GDP. We passed the United Kingdom last year. So California, yeah, you don't have to like California, but is it a good place to invest? Absolutely. I mean, you've got major universities, entertainment industry, shipping, import, export. The number one container port in the U.S., fifth in the world, is the Port of Long Beach, the Port of Los Angeles, called the San Pedro Bay. So the goods come into that, uh, into the port, direct shot from overseas, and then they make their way up to the Antelope Valley because you have major distribution facilities like Rite Aid, Michaels, Pepsi, Coke, Frito-Lay, Morton Manufacturing, Fastenal, et cetera. So the goods make their way up there to these warehouse facilities that are huge job creators, right? Um, Kevin Costner movie, if you build it, they will come. Um, right, right, right. Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams, thank you. So that's really how it works. As the jobs are created, the population naturally follows. With over 13,000 businesses in the Antelope Valley and Palmdale winning the Eddie Award in 2015, there's 88 cities in LA County and the Eddie Award's the most business friendly city. Lancaster, the bordering city, has won it um, twice years prior to that. So their testament and their, their push uh, to make this area business friendly with tax incentives and credits, foreign trade zones, enterprise zones, opportunity zones. It's really driving a lot of business out in this area because the, this is the last place you can go. There's no more dirt left in that LA basin. That's affordable. Mm. Mm. And our other um, geographical, not challenge, but what really helps us is going back to that dot in LA city center. A third of it is in the ocean of that 60 mile radius. Okay. So in this mm. small area, two thirds. Now, if we're still looking at that, that dot in LA city center, when you go to the East, you have a mountain range, the San Gabriel mountains. So you can't go that way either. You've got to go to the one predictable place, which is on the other side of that mountain, which is why they've spent so much money widening that 14 freeway to allow that artery to flow. And you can't go South because what is South? The only open land going South yeah. between here and Mexico is Camp Pendleton. That's right. That's right. So you basically have like, like obviously people love living in California, even though it's probably not the best for taxes or whatever, but people love living here. Right. And right. it's been built up so much. And then you've got this little spot of land left where these monster houses are 350 grand instead of seven or 800,000. Right? right. And it all sounds too good to be true. And I go there, go on this tour and I'm listening to this and I'm like, wait a minute, they're building a high speed train. They widened the highway. They spent X amount of dollars. And I'm thinking, I look back at the 2008, 2009 mortgage crash and all the movies that have been made about that, the mortgage meltdown and blah, blah, blah. And when you talk to the people that were paying attention and sort of had a dashboard, they, they didn't, I mean, they saw it coming. It was sort of predictable if you were paying attention and had the data, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was oh, just anybody sure. that wasn't paying attention or didn't care, surprise, it, there are signs and all investing is about probabilities. None of this is a guarantee, right? Correct. But when I, when I traded foreign currencies for two and a half years full time from midnight to 8 a.m. because it was based on London time, um, horrible experience. I had to like sleep in my bed with my laptop because I was stuck in trades and stuff like that. Just not fun at all, right? But my training taught me something that I really have used multiple times. It's get probability on your side. That's not a guarantee. You, even like angel investors are going to put money into like 100 companies and 98 of them, they lose money and two of them turn out to be Google and Apple or whatever, you know? Right. It's get probabilities on your side. Is it a guarantee that the Antelope Valley is going to appreciate like crazy? No. But when you go, how much did the government spend there? How much did Arnold Schwarzenegger, the further governor or the former governor buy there? Ted Turner, I've, I've been telling people, I, I created this little flyer. I said, and it has Ted Turner's picture in his name, Arnold Schwarzenegger's picture in his name, 
and you tell me if I'm speaking, uh, if I say something that's not true, then it has um, Warren Buffett in his name. And then I just have that blank Facebook head with the weird hair sticking up, you know, where you don't put a picture on Facebook right. and a question mark and just say, if these three guys studied the entire United States and all put money into the exact same town, believing that it would appreciate whose picture goes there next. That's right. And the answer they give me is me, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah me too, right? I'm, I'm going to be a landholder there. It's not a guarantee, but there are signs when tons of big money and people that do more research than any of my listeners will ever do have all started pouring money into the place. Absolutely correct. I mean, as far as retail, what do you, how do you feel about Walmart? Uh, meaning, are they smart and strategic? Well, not only are they smart and strategic, I think they're probably the smartest, most strategic company on the planet because their profit margins are so stinking tight. You know, I mean, I used to study a lot of Michael Gerber and I think their profit margins are like seven or eight percent. He's like, their profit margins are so small, they can't even borrow money and make it work, right? But isn't there that story of the guy that worked at Kmart for 30 years and never really did anything except follow Walmart around and he looked like a genius? That's, <laughs> that's right. I mean, I wish I had that job, right? Just like follow some other guy and and make a killing and look like a genius. Yeah. So I bring up Walmart because yeah, huge research development department for them to have brick and mortar in an area because a lot of companies obviously are going e-commerce, but uh, the fact that they have five Walmarts, five of them open functioning between two cities, Lancaster and Palmdale that border each other. I mean, think of what city you're in right now and where I am. Are there right. Walmarts between the two cities? No. Are there four Home Depots? No. Are there three Lowe's? No. And all of the other companies out there as well. When you've got, you know, uh, CarMax, you've got, you know, kind of somewhat budgety, if you will, um, uh, stores and commerce like Walmart, you know, they're smart. They know what to do and where to go to um, maximize their profits for their general area, of course, right? I mean, they study this stuff like crazy. So for them to do that, it means a lot. It truly does. And uh, the others out there as well, Starbucks, McDonald's. I mean, how many home builders, how many different signs of new homes did you see when you were on the tour? I saw a ton of new homes. And then the other thing that was intriguing to me is I'm like, this is not even a tourist destination. Like I didn't see an amusement park or beaches or anything. And yet it seemed like the hotel chains were like scrambling, <laughs> right? <laughs> to build, it's, I mean, I think a Walmart needs 250,000 homes to be profitable or to hit their numbers or whatever. There's five Walmarts. There's not 1.25 million people there right now, is there? No, there's not. Shy of 600,000. And I think... Um, it was Orange County where they had estimated like 1.9 million and Orange County now has like 3.6 million. Yeah, it was 1.8. That's good. You've done your homework. I love this. I just got, I got excited. I mean, there's like, thankfully I have this other asset class. I mean, you can probably you, see the smile on my face right now. I can hear the smile on your face, Brian. And here's the nice thing. Um, I believe your company, I mean, your company is exploding, but I believe it's small enough at this point where, Anybody that responds and reaches out and says, Charlie, I'd really like to like take a peek. It's actually you and I on the phone together or the agent that referred them to my show and, and you, right? That's correct. Yep. It won't I, be like that forever. I mean, it can't be like that forever, but in the beginning, well, you guys aren't in the beginning, but as of right now, if you're doing all the client conversations and the teaching, really anybody listening to your voice is going to end up on the phone with you, be able to ask whatever questions they want to and kick the tires. I mean, how many, how many conversations have you had with people that end up buying land? how many conversations that uh, that have bought it's got to be thousands right oh goodness yeah absolutely when when they when when i'm sitting down in front of somebody or on the phone webinar when they're tuned in and the agent did a good job as far as introducing at a thirty thousand foot view are you familiar with land banking or how much real estate do you own in your retirement plan do you own any real estate in your retirement plan however they tee it up and we go through all of that of course um, to get them up to speed and then make sure that they're qualified. They've got 40,000 or, or more in cash or existing investments. And once that happens and they're on a call, our closing ratio is extremely high. Here's the thing. People want real estate, not necessarily do they want to deal with tenants, toilets, and trash, right? right. In cruises, cruises, clubs, and cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. That's so, one of my episodes, by the way, from tenants, toilets, and trash to cruises, clubs, and cocktails. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's hilarious. But you know, our biggest problem, Char, uh, Charlie, is simply that you know this isn't mainstream media. It, every commercial you see on a financial you know network or, or commercial, it's about this ETF or mutual fund or insurance. What's interesting is the financial industry really doesn't want individuals to know that they can do this. And here's why. They don't want the money to leave from under management. If there's a couple hundred thousand with one of the companies out there, the big firms, and a hundred thousand moves to a self-directed IRA so they can buy real estate without writing a check, qualifying for a loan or making a payment, you're simply reappropriating part of your money that's in the market or mutual funds into owning real estate. Well, now that money is just left under management. So they're no longer collecting the amount of fees, correct? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yep. Yeah. It's interesting. I've been on the phone with financial advisors who step in and, and try to prevent them from moving the client from moving the money and X, Y, and Z. And I'll share with him what we do. One guy who's been in the business for 30 years told me, you can't do that. And I said, well, what's your email address? So I sent him over IRS code 408, mm -hmm. which allows you to own real estate as an investment inside of a qualified plan. And his response was, wow, I didn't know. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. How long have you been? Well, you told me you've been doing this for 30 years, but how long have you been with this firm? 30 years, I haven't gone anywhere else. Well, that's why. You've got this many elections underneath this umbrella with our company. You can offer these products. You can't sell away to a product outside of here for obvious reasons, money. Yep, yep. And then, you know, taking a step back, because you were mentioning something earlier, if somebody, you know, um, hits a home run and they sell quickly, they're not taxed on that money. If it's owned inside of a qualified account, it's considered market growth or gain. So example, I put a hundred grand in um, and, you know, call it five years, it turns into 200 grand, okay? Using examples here. That money goes back into the self-directed IRA. So I can self-direct back, out into stocks, bonds, mutual funds. I can buy more real estate with it. I'm not taxed on it until I pull it out at retirement and, and uh, pay taxes, ordinary income. Well, let's talk about something near and dear to my heart. So I started 14 years ago, 2005, doing only tax-free retirement planning, just maximum funded life insurance, EF Hutton style. I've gotten better at the design, but I started, that was my baby. That's all I did for four years before I even learned about annuities or anything, right? So I'm, for, so you, you know that I love Rob. I'm this guy, Rob, that we both know is like a total stud at this. So I'm having a great time. Um, yes. Let's talk about um, this for a moment. Genius, awesome, amazing opportunity that people take an old 401k from a job they're no longer with or take any IRA they've been working, saving money in or inherited or whatever. They can buy this inside of that. That's awesome, right? Um, the other awesome thing is we're at a place where the market really does need a correction. Like no one knows when it's coming. But if you just look at, you know, the history of the market and how expensive things are and expense ratios and all that, the market's oversold. A lot of it was quantitative easing. A lot of us are expecting a crash. It may be a nice time to just grab all those free profits you got. Yeah, the government was buying their own bonds, sort of listing stuff on Craigslist and buying from themselves and calling it profit. And it wasn't really real growth. It was fake growth. If you watch David McKnight's movie, The Power of Zero, they actually call it fake growth. The economists but you got it right now. Grab it, lock it in, and move it somewhere that that's got a, a that doesn't have those crashes. Like you're not having times where you buy this land and in 2008 it goes down by 38 percent, right? Right, because the study that we had or that we have on our website it had 08, 07, 09 inside of that study, and it nice. shows significant upside and gains because. You know, think of an area, you can probably identify an area where you are today that you've seen grow over the last 10, 15, 20 years, right? But I think the where I was sitting with you in Chino, or you weren't there, but where I was sitting at your company in Chino Hills, they were saying 12 years ago, you could have got uh, an acre for $32,000. Yeah. And then it was like, I mean, there's like a huge highway. There's like buildings everywhere. I don't know what the acreage costs now, but um, Andre was talking to a guy that lived in Chino Hills and saying, you know, like it's up 10, 15 times. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're looking million dollars an acre in spots. I mean, you know, an acre is 43,560 square feet. Imagine how many single family homes you can put on one acre, especially in Southern California, because everybody's literally right on top of each other. So the value of that dirt is massive. It, it's really 
<laughs> I'm a real estate guy from the past. So I'm like driving around in the bus looking at this, all this expansion. And I'm like, where's, where's the crappiest house I can buy? Like I want to buy the worst house in a nice neighborhood, <laughs> right? So, buy the land and buy a house and rent it or whatever. So yeah. here, here, I care about Roth conversions. Like I really care about tax-free retirement planning and converting people from having overfunded IRAs and 401ks and listen to the sort of the old mantra, postpone taxes to a later date. And you'll be in a lower tax bracket when they probably won't be in a lower tax bracket because they pay off their house. No kids living at home. And um, they are paying taxes on their IRA distributions. So I care about this. Um, what excites me is, like, just think about this question for a moment. If one of your investments really could make double-digit returns, and the other ones are probably not. So some of them are going to be making four, five, six. But another one really has a chance in history of making 10, 11, or 12 do you want to make the 10 or 11 or 12 where you're, you're doubling the size of your account a lot quicker and a lot less years. Do you want to really grow the account that the IRS takes a piece of to be the really big one? Or would you like the really big fast growing account to be the one where it's tax free and you get to keep it all? Like what would you want? Well, of course tax free. Yeah. So there's a piece of me that's like, this is rad, man. Like people can transfer IRA money and 401k money and do the land piece of their portfolio where they do their Roth conversions because it's not a guarantee, but there's some really cool probabilities and really cool historical numbers and case studies and stuff to say, this has more, like think about the stock market where we're at today, right? Make it 2.5 to 4.78, including the stinking run up from 2008 till now, right? right? Including quantitative easing. And now the baby boomers are retiring and the same people that drove it up are now starting to sell off and do this kind of stuff, buy annuities, life insurance, and land. I just don't see the stock market for the next 10 years going up in double digits. It just doesn't, the probabilities aren't there for me, right? Well, yeah. And if we think about it, everybody I ask that question to, are you concerned with the market? Do you think there's going to be a correction? Every single person I've asked that to over the last couple of years, absolutely, without question. They do. And if we go back to March of 2009, the market dropped 54%, 6,490.4 points, I believe. I'm real close, give or take, plus or minus 10 uh, points there. But a 54% drop. 401ks became what? 201k. 201k, right? <laughs> Cut in half. And yep. So, so right now, when we're realizing all of these gains and the market is up, it's, it's inevitable. It's going to correct. So if I've got a hundred, you know, for round numbers, a hundred thousand bucks in the market right now, and there's a 10% drop across the board or 15% or 20% or gosh, hopefully um, not any more than that, but going back to 09, it's possible. Right. And, and I can reappropriate and reallocate those funds to the oldest, safest, most secure form of wealth creation with a grant deed with title insurance on fee simple land. It's mine. I own it. Right. And on top of it, I'm buying this real estate at a 20 to 40% discount. Every one of our parcels has equity built in day one. So not only am I protecting and preserving my money, but I'm also buying um, something that has equity right out of the gates to jumpstart my retirement plan. And let me stop you right there because I've done a, a lot of research on real estate investing and basically got out of the game for a long time until I found this guy named Chris Prefontaine, who just has a really cool sort of sandwich lease uh, program where everybody wins, right? You're not ripping people off. You're actually paying full price. And because what I found in the um, flipping world or any sort of real estate investing world that involved houses that were already built was I kind of had to do unto others what I would never want done to me, right? Like find someone who's suffering and buy their house for less than you really should be paying to create your spread. Does that make sense? Sure. From what I'm hearing from Andre, the owner of the company, and from you on um, different conversations that I've had with people is this is not like that. This is not like find someone who's suffering and go in and, and be like, bro, ha, ha, ha. It's more like nine, you know, 10 kids inherit this piece of land their parents had that they don't know anything about and they don't even want it. And they're like, I don't want this. Like, get rid of this thing. Or there's some, some like some um, time sensitivity or something like that. And you guys are like, well, we have cash. We always buy cash. We've got cash and we'll give you this much for it. And is that less than they could sell it for if they held it for seven to 10 years? Probably. But they're actually saying to you, I get it. It's worth 250. If you can give me $150,000 right now, I'm all about it. Cause this was dad's land and I don't, I just don't care. Right. Yep. 
Cause That's I don't want, I don't want to be in the business of ripping people off to create a spread. I want to be in the business of everybody wins. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's what makes all of this go around. Cash is king, right? Cash is king. It's got to be mutually beneficial to everybody, right? At the end of the day. And that's, that's really where we focus and uh, what we try to do when we're making these offers where it's fair to the seller, but we still have a business to run, right? And if they're willing to move forward and sell, if there's liens, tax title issues, encumbrances that need to be cleared up or cleaned up, uh, which would have prevented them from being able to sell anyway, we'll tackle those issues as well. So that yeah. really helps. quick closing cash transactions. And uh, that's how it works. So let me wrap up with, with two more things. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the time people get to spend with you. And then I want to talk about four groups that I think can benefit from this and tell them how to reach out. Okay. Okay. Um, if someone reaches out and they get in touch, uh, they're going to end up talking to you on, on the phone or on a webinar, unless they happen to live in your town. Right. Correct. <laughs> um, uh, what, how much time do you spend with someone typically? Is it 30 minutes? Is it an hour? What's it, what's it take to get someone from A to Z to really, I mean, I always teach people are geniuses when they see clearly. So they don't really need an advisor telling them what to do. They need someone that doesn't hide everything and lays it all out there so they can go, Oh, I get it. How much time do you spend with people? Well, when the appointment is scheduled, the agent handles that part and that's scheduled. I budget for an hour. Uh, Oftentimes I'm done in 35 minutes, 40 minutes. It just depends on the interaction from the customer on the other end. Uh, so yeah, basically an hour is fine. Perfect. Perfect. That's easy. Right. Yeah. And you know how it works is it's not, it's oftentimes people get on the phone and I can tell, I, you know, like you can see me smiling. I can tell that they're in a defensive posture. And right out of the gates, I just let them know, look, this is not the way that I'm speaking to you now is exactly how I'm going to share the information. This is all about fact finding and gathering, learning about something new so you can be empowered to make your financial decision. Yeah, we're not trying to talk people into it. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And you know what? The evidence, the facts, everything that's going on out there, we don't need to. All I do is share the facts and the evidence and the information and, and that works. I mean, this area since 1953 has been the aerospace capital of the US. So you have huge, huge facilities, massive economy as it relates to military and aerospace, which is only growing, um, you know, going back to, uh, you know, I was talking about some of the stores and whatnot that are out there, but you mentioned hotels. Two extended stay hotels built last year, three more are being built this year. They've got all the other major hotel chains are already there, the car dealerships, et cetera. But, uh, you know, you have so many different industries that can prop up one. If you're splitting, uh, spinning plates and one of them starting to, to wobble a bit, well, you focus a, a little bit of attention on it. You get it back up and going again. But my point being is that if that one wobbles and you can't kickstart it for another year or two years because it may be a sector that's going through a challenge, you've got so many other industries in this area to keep the economy um, thriving and not just surviving. Right. Really, right. You've got to have a balance, you know, years and years ago, there was one industry out here, which was military and aerospace. Yep. And when funding gets cut, everybody suffers. That's not the case anymore because you've got renewable energy. Warren Buffett built the largest solar farm in the world at $2.5 billion. He's out in this area. And when he vets a, a business, a company, an area, he does it better than anybody in my opinion. I don't even think Temecula had that much going for it. Right. And Temecula exploded. Exploded. And the uh, reason I brought up, uh, the reason I brought up Orange County at the 1.8 million estimate and they got 3.6 is we talked about the Walmarts. There's only 600,000 people there or whatever. And Walmart has enough places built already to support 1.25. What's the estimate there? I was in the 1.8s or nines or something like that, right? Yeah. You know, we see different estimated numbers and whatnot. I, I always stick to 1.5 million okay. is, what, is what they'll estimate. And, you know, San Diego County, similar situation. I think they anticipated 1.25. Now you're at what, three? And they're still building. I live in San Diego. Still building. And you drive around and the traffic is horrendous. I mean, I love Sundays because the highway system is actually pretty rad when there's no cars on it. <laughs> but the, the traffic is horrendous. And I drive around and I'm like, how are they still building? <laughs> right? And, and the Antelope Valley is not even, I don't know, it's not even five or 10% as Diego. Um, so I can get people on the phone with you, get them on a webinar with you if, if it would be helpful for them. I think there's really four groups 
of people that would benefit from this. So if it's okay, I'm going to highlight those four groups and tell them how to get in touch with me. Okay. Perfect. One is just straight customers. I mean, I started this podcast for the, the, the consumer, the person in the United States who was working with an Edward Morgan Lynch company or didn't have leadership and just wanted to have a great financial plan. And I've taught them in case income increase, three types of money, you know, five lives of retirement, long life, short life, rough life, sick life, merit planning, mortgage plan, estate plan, retirement plan, insurance plan, and tax plan. How do we be efficient and blend it all together? So certainly anybody listening who just is trying to make an incredible retirement for yourselves, diversify your own portfolio. Maybe you don't have fixed assets in your portfolio or something that's not correlated with the stock market. Maybe your portfolio is still in the stock market and you want to protect it before what looks like we have a, a crash coming at some point. Certainly consumers can get in touch at info at l5wealth.com, info at l the letter five, the number wealth.com. And then we end up on the phone with you, Brian, talking shop, right? That's it. The other group, which is really interesting to me, would be real estate agents. Because I've, I've had this sort of long partnership with real estate agents. I was a real estate agent in the early 2000s and I've sort of always partnered with real estate agents because I just see the value of, of real estate and mortgages in my planning. But I, I think I heard something uh, from you guys, like a third of the customers over the last nine years are real estate agents. Correct. Them them uh, themselves, not so, necessarily their client. Yeah. Real estate agents believe in real estate and they see what you're doing and they buy. A third is a, a third of your customers being from one profession is pretty, that's pretty niche, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, it's true, but it, it, it makes sense. They understand it. They get it, right? And yeah. And then, you know, for their clients and customers, how many times have we, you know, taken a, a prospective buyer, you know, out and showed, 20, 30 homes uh, a month, two months down the road, and all of a sudden something pops up. Maybe there's a lien or, or something on credit, preventing them from even being able to get qualified when they were pre-qualified before, but something changed or debt ratio. Now this person or, or individual cannot buy a house or can't get qualified, but they can still buy real estate because real estate right. agents and realtors, you know, that gets real personal. They get really personal with their customers, of course, spending a lot of time with them. So they know that they've got IRAs, 401ks. They know that they have money in the market oftentimes. And this is still a way to, as, as an ancillary product, as you know, not to distract from the shiny object, which is their core business model, but it's still a way for them to make money and still provide a service to a customer who wants to own real estate. Now, it's not the end-all, be-all that they, you know, the house that they want. However, they can still take part in real estate from that perspective. And you're mentioning something that, that I want to make really clear is that the realtor, a lot of realtors buy this for themselves, but they don't have to leave their own companies yet. You guys have set up a system where they can sell it to people as a, another source of income, right? Correct. Yes. That would uh, definitely, have, there's an agreement and all things put in place as far as a referral agreement. And yeah, we've got all checks and balances in place to make that happen. So real estate agents, if you're listening, definitely get in touch info at L5 wealth info at L, the letter five, the number wealth.com. Um, current agents and advisors, kind of the same thing. Definitely put it in your own portfolio, but you guys have a system where they can offer it to their clients, right? That's right. And then really interesting to me, I know you and I are not doing screen sharing, so you can't really see this, but I'm looking up my statistics for the podcast. And I started three years ago and most of my listeners come from the United States. So when I look at this thing, you know, uh, Alaska and the, the, the main United States are the most listeners, but here we go. Canada, ton of listeners, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, South Africa, Australia, Thailand, India, Russia, no annuity or life insurance policy that I use to help people can be sold in any of those countries. Land banking's different. Am I right? That's correct. Absolutely. And from what I've heard, it's not a stereotype, but from my, what I've heard from studying the land banking is it seems like people in other countries, the Asian countries are really excited about it, but people in other countries really, really get excited about the idea of owning a piece of the United States or owning a piece of California. So the people who are listening or listening to my podcast who are in other countries, you can do this as well, but the groups we just talked to, people that would like to um, get into their own business or realtors that would like to offer another product or advisors that want to offer another product. How cool is that, that you're not limited to the United States, but you could offer it to anybody anywhere in the world? It's amazing. I mean, you can be anywhere in the entire world and have a map or, or a globe 
globe, if you will, and point out Los Angeles. Everybody knows exactly where it's at. Exactly. And are they really doing a high-speed train? I mean, I mentioned it earlier, but it just sounds so exotic. <laughs> well, yeah, so, and California high-speed rail, this, that's not the one that we share in the presentation anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you read between the lines, that's not dead. They're still going to complete the one section, but what um, current Governor Newsom did was he opened up the other segments to private money to fulfill mm. those obligations. So the environmental studies are still taking place. The train that we share is called, uh, well, it's going to be Virgin Trains. A company called Brightline has a contract that goes from Palmdale at the transit center uh, over to Victorville and then out to Las Vegas. Mm. Done with the Las Vegas to Victorville section by 2022. Wow. So yeah, when Brightline took over this contract from a company called Express West, Three weeks after Brightline got involved, Richard Branson's company, Virgin Trains, partnered with them, announced their uh, IPO earlier this year to fund this thing. And, you know, to have Richard Branson behind this, obviously he's got lots and lots of money. He's politically connected. He's got his space company out in the Antelope Valley as well, obviously, again, because uh, that's the place to do it, being the aerospace capital of the U.S. Um, so he's heavily involved in the area, and uh, he's bringing that one to fruition. Well, that's another name. So why don't we just wrap it up with this part that got me excited. Richard Branson, Ted Turner, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was the governor for California, right? So he obviously understands the different areas. And Warren Buffett, who my understanding is Warren Buffett doesn't do anything without much more research than any one of us would ever do. All four of those guys, right? All yeah, four of them investing in the area. Are you familiar with Bob Hope's story? No. When he passed, his net worth was $800 million. He made $100 million in entertaining. In the 50s, his brother, stockbroker, shared with him to buy the land, San Fernando Valley, the bean fields. He did mm. in the L.A. area. And then he did the same thing in Palm Springs as well as in Phoenix. His net worth in real estate alone was estimated at $700 million. Oprah Winfrey's quoted after 2009 saying she bought real estate, land, 300 acres, because not where we are, but in Virginia, 300 acres, because she said, look, the market is going to correct again. I don't want to lose land always has value and uh, we can't make any more of it. So yeah, that's I mean, so cool. That's so cool. And we, we don't, we're not saying to somebody take every dollar in your life, oh, put absolutely. it into, put it into something that's illiquid and take seven to 10 years. We're saying as we work together and build a diversified portfolio of things that don't all go up and down together, uh, but which is my problem with most people's portfolios is it's all securities, it's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds sold by some company and they all go up and down together. We're saying there's some piece of your assets that should probably be in a fixed asset like land that has really high potential. And what's the minimum around $40,000? That's correct. And then every now and then, I think Andre was saying every now and then you'll have a, a piece that everyone bought everything and there's 17,000 left. And so they'll make a special offering, but it's really 40,000 or more, right? That's correct. Okay. Well, let's wrap it up, Ryan. That's that. It's absolutely incredible. I said one of the most exciting things that I've that's come into my world as far as products that can be offered or solutions, and it's really helpful in what I call the stockless portfolio. Because it's not that I don't want people to use the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. I don't want them to be addicted to them. <laughs> I want them to know how to do that same kind of a thing. Some part of your portfolio makes zero to two. Some makes four to six, and some makes you know eight to ten or whatever. Right. Yep. And when the eight to 10 goes on sale, you take from your zero to two and you buy more of it or whatever. And it sounds like land banking has a place in most people's portfolios, unless they're just starting at 22 years old, you know, starting to save. Well, I've done a hundred thousand dollar transaction for an 18 year old who inherited an IRA, but yes, to answer your question. Yes. It's, That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. You no. Know, yeah. If I could just add real quick, you know, Really where we see a lot of our business going back to, you know, 18 to um, 85 for legacy planning, right? But, you know, we see a lot in the, and I never want to pigeonhole or say that this is the demographic or age uh, range, but a lot from 30, 35 to 50, 55, 60 who are going, oh my gosh, I've worked for this company for 20 years. How am I going to make up for lost time? I'm not going to have millions and millions when I retire, um, you know, looking for a different way to create and make up for that lost time. You know, uh, Ted Benna, are you familiar with Ted Benna, B-E-N-N-A? No. 
He's the creator of the 401k plan that started in 19. 19- oh, he said it was become a monster. Yeah. I have an episode on that. So now I know who you're talking about. That's right. Yeah. So it's created in 1978, not as the end all be all, but to complement other retirement plans like pensions, right? Yes. Those anymore. But oftentimes, especially, you know, now people will follow the follower. I did it back in early 2000, 2001. I didn't know which mutual fund to choose. And I'm filling out my 401k paperwork from a, a previous employer a long time ago. And I ask a buddy, well, what do you think about this one or that one? He goes, well, I just did this because he said that. And okay, I checked that one and move forward and, and move on. And that's, that's a huge challenge. And we see that often because people don't understand how stocks, bonds, mutual funds work. And they do understand though, the value of real estate and owning something that I can see, feel and touch. It's tangible. Right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. People get excited about land and land has done really, really well. So land should be a part of what, what people do to diversify. Yeah. And why do we buy land? They're not making it. They're not making it anymore. <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking about all the stuff we talked about. I'm like, which one of the awesome nuggets are we supposed to say here? <laughs> they're not, they're not making any more of it. Right. That's right. I mean, the supply and demand could not be more obvious than with land. Like the earth is the earth. California is California, right? The Los Angeles area is the Los Angeles area. It just it, supply and demand says when there's lower supply, then prices go up and we're running out of supply. That's right. Well, I think people would benefit tremendously from having a conversation with you, uh, whether they're totally sold or whether they have some questions. So guys, please get in touch. Info at L, the letter, five, the number, wealth.com, or you can call me directly, 888-285-2268. Or if an agent, you know, I, I have a lot of agents listening, a lot of agents I'm, agents I'm now working with who are uh, enjoying the show and handing it to their clients and passing it out and spreading the word. So if somebody gave you this show and they're in the business, just go ahead and get in touch with them. But um, I would love to get you on the phone with Brian. Brian will take great care of you and make sure that your portfolio is diversified as it can be. So Charlie Jewett signing off. Brian, thank you so much for being on. We will have you on again uh, to hit this from a couple of different angles and talk about more things. But I really, really appreciate it. It's been a long show. Uh, which is awesome. That's sort of probably characteristic of you and I talking about something we're excited about, I imagine, right? Um, So we will wrap it up here. Be back you guys soon with another episode. Brian, thank you so much for your time. I know you're off doing baseball and stuff like that, but thanks for taking the time. Hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Renovate. Retirement. With Charlie Jewett. That's all, folks.